Hi everybody, Les Olszewski here, and today's story and video is going to be about natural iron ore. That's iron ore just as it was when they took it out of the ground back in the olden days. So stay tuned for all about natural iron ore. Whoops. The existence of iron ore in the Lake Superior region was known as long as humans walked the surrounding land. Early Indians and later trappers often encountered the red rocks and soil and thought little of it. In September 1844, Jacob Houghton, William Ives, H. Millen, R. S. Millen, James King, plus two Indian guides, embarked on a survey of the Lake Superior shore region. Compass Man Ives discovered an area near present-day Marquette, which caused his magnetic compass to deviate a remarkable 80 degrees. They mapped the approximate area, and then they left. In the summer of 1845, P.M. Everett was exploring the region in quest of minerals of value, such as copper. Led by a Chippewa guide, the party discovered what Everett described as a mountain of pure iron ore, 150 feet high. Everett packed up a good-sized sample of the ore and brought it back to Jackson, Michigan where he had some of it smelted down. It was the first iron ore to be shipped down the Great Lakes. The first usable ore, however, was smelted on the Carp River in the UP by forgeman A. N. Barney on February 10, 1848. That iron was sold to Captain E. B. Ward of Marine City. He used it in construction of his wooden sidewheel passenger boat, Ocean, which was launched in April of 1850 and departed on her first trip on May 28, 1850. By 1873, however, the same vessel had been reduced to a lumber barge, and while in tow of the tug rescue, she broke loose and wrecked off Port Hope, Michigan on October 20, 1873. So, the first Lake Superior iron ore ever used now rests on the bottom of Lake Huron. Industrial transport of iron ore on the Great Lakes did not really get underway until the opening of the Sioux Locks in 1855. That season it was primarily ore from the Jackson Mine and a great total of, believe it or not, 1,447 tons was shipped. The following season, 1856, just over eight times as much ore passed through the Sioux, with a total of 11,597 tons locking down. Although smelted iron had been shipped through the Sioux Locks to the Lower Lakes by steamer in 1855 and 1856, according to Beers, the first bulk iron ore shipment moved downbound by a steamer took place in June of 1856. That ore was part of one of the first loads ever carried by the brand new propeller Ontonagon. She left Buffalo on June 1st under the command of Captain Wilkins headed for Marquette. It would have taken her a full week to reach Marquette from which she later departed on June 18th with her iron ore. She reportedly delivered the ore to Cleveland on June 24th. By 1860 the seasonal total had hit 120,000 tons. Most of the ore was shipped in bulk and carried by schooners. The simple economics were such that 
hand loading and unloading the bulk iron ore took a great deal of time. Steamers of those early times needed to quickly get in and out of port and keep moving in order to earn a profit. A schooner, however, had lower overhead costs and could afford to linger at the docks while the iron ore was loaded and unloaded with shovels and bucket hoists. An additional problem was that the configuration of Great Lakes steamers was completely unfriendly to the efficient loading and unloading of bulk cargoes. Bulk freight would have to be barreled and wheeled aboard and later unloaded in the same manner. The first elevated ore loading dock was constructed at Marquette in 1857. The first modern ore dock was constructed a decade and a half later and shipped its first cargo on May 12, 1872. It measured 1,222 feet in length, with a working length of 720 feet. Towering 38 feet above the water, the dock's width of 53 feet could support railroad tracks. The cars were rolled in. The hopper doors underneath were open and the ore was allowed to drop into the loading pockets where it waited to be dropped into the vessel. There were loading pockets on both sides of the dock. Eight sailing vessels of the era could be loaded at the same time. In those days, schooners with their hatches right on the deck were far more friendly to loading at the ore dock's gravity chutes than steamers. Their disadvantage was that sailing vessels were dependent on the wind or steam tugs to move anywhere. In 1869, longtime shipbuilder Eli Peck combined the advantages of steamers and sailing vessels. He constructed a boxy steam propeller that had the same deck top loading hatches as a sailing vessel. It was a matter of simply deleting the passenger cabins and using that open area for cargo hatches. This left the engine workings aft and the pilot house forward. His boat was christened the R.J. Hackett and was given a consort barge whose hull was nearly a twin. She was called the Forest City. Peck had designed the Hackett with a blunt bow and her boxy hull provided greater buoyancy to the point where she could carry more cargo than other propellers, which were slightly larger but more streamlined. So successful was the Hackett's design that after just one full season as a tow barge, the Forest City was also given her own engine. You can see here she took advantage of the overhead systems of the era. Unwittingly, the Hackett and Forest City's profile would become the standard for lake boats. Of course, the other part of the natural iron ore equation is the unloading of the bulk material. In the beginning, the unloading was done with hand shovels and wooden buckets lifted by ropes, pulleys, and horses. As the amount of iron ore being received at the Lake Erie docks began to rapidly grow, the horses were replaced by steam. Steam-powered whirly unloaders came next and were a vast improvement over the poor horses. The first big solution to the laborious unloading process was seated in 1880 when Alexander Ephraim Brown developed his hoist system. Known, of course, as the Brown Hoist, this network of bridge-like supports, cables, pulleys, and a bucket both sped and economized the unloading of iron ore from lake boats. Yet there were growing pains. The first newspaper mention of the Brown Hoist being used came from Ashtabula and stated that the trestles were, quote, working, but not with much success yet, unquote. Just three years later, the Marine Record boasted on their front page that the Brown Hoist at Ashtabula 
had unloaded 1,157 tons of ore from the steamer Forest City in just seven hours. By 1887 standards, that was amazing. From that point on, the brown hoists were being constructed all around the Great Lakes. Yet with success comes imitation. Thus we have a device nearly identical to the brown hoists. They were called the King Bridge Company Hoists. The most outward difference between the two systems was that the Browns had two legs at the loading end and the Kings had only one. Brown Hoist, however, sought to improve on their unloading equipment. In the mid-1890s, they marketed a shortened version of their ore hoist, officially called, quote, Brown Patent Movable Conveying Apparatus for the Rapid Handling of Coal and Ore, unquote, or simply, the Brown Fast Unloader. It went into service at Cleveland in 1897. Rather than having the ore buckets travel 400 feet to dump in a storage pile, this fast version had them travel just 30 feet and dump directly into rail cars, thus making the process faster. Yet even with all of these innovations, the unloading crews still had to be down in the boat's cargo hold to shovel the ore into the buckets. Only now, instead of wooden buckets, they had steel buckets. Plus, at many ports, the buckets were still dumped by hand into rail cars. There was a design coming that would become the standard for nearly a century. It was a gigantic steel monster that could grab 10 tons or more from a boat in a single bite and its name was Hullet. Pronounced either Hewlett or Hall It, depending on which part of the country you're from, the name was George H. Hullet, and we associate him with iron ore unloading to this day. Mr. Hullet began to patent methods for handling iron ore in the late 1880s and 1890s. He also patented methods for other bulk cargo, such as coal. His masterpiece, however, was his, quote, automatic ship unloader, which wasn't really automatic. He showed drawings of his concept off to steel baron Andrew Carnegie in 1898. The steel man was interested, but shrewd enough to insist on seeing the real thing working full scale before he would invest. With that, Hullett went out and got $45,000 in private capital in 1899 to construct a full scale unloader on Carnegie property at Conneaut, Ohio. In November of that same year, Andrew Carnegie and his company's president, Charles Schwab, arrived in Conneaut aboard their private rail train to see if Hullet's unloader actually worked. What they witnessed was a massive steam-powered machine effortlessly gliding its clamshell leg over the open hold of an ore carrier. Looking at his watch, Carnegie noted the time as the leg lowered into the hold took a 10-ton bite of ore, and then swiftly raised up out of the cargo hold, and in practically the same motion, move the load backward and dump it precisely into a waiting rail car. The entire operation took less than two minutes. Carnegie had seen enough. He ordered two more unloaders to be constructed and in service by the opening of the 1901 season. For the next nine decades, 
how it would serve the Great Lakes ore trade at every iron ore receiving port. Basically, the end of the use of natural ore came about due to one aspect of the ore itself. When it is mined, natural ore has a high water content. That aspect has always hindered its loading in cold months. The bitter winds and sub-zero temperatures in the Lake Superior region caused the ore to freeze in the rail cars and defeated the gravity loading docks. This caused the ore handlers to resort to steaming the ore at the loading dock in order to try and get it to flow. In the worst cases, ore boats could be waiting at the dock delayed for days just to get a load that was frozen in the cars above. A solution to that handling issue was developed following World War II. It is called taconite. This is a form of powdered iron ore that is formed into marble-sized pellets and kilned. These pellets come out rock hard and bone dry, which makes them easy to load in any weather conditions. Taconite is also very self-unloader friendly, which spelled the end of the hullets. The last hullet on the lakes was disassembled in 1999. Yet taconite aboard Great Lakes self-unloaders continues to be shipped today.